Welcome back guys, in this video I'm going to walk you through a complete landscape photo edit inside Luminar Neo. I'm going to share lots of tips and tricks along the way, so let's get into it. Inside the Luminar Neo catalogue here we have two very similar photos, they were shot seconds apart. The only difference is the one on the right here was shot with a polarising filter, where this was shot just as is through my camera. I prefer the polarised version because it accentuates the complementary blue-yellow colour scheme that we've got going on, so it's that version that I'm going to be working on. I'm just going to add a plain red layer with a mask over the top of it for the purpose of marking up this photo. Before you start any photo edit, I always recommend you have a plan of attack. So let's analyze this photo and see what we want to do. The first thing you notice is we have a strong lead in line from the bottom left hand side, taking our viewer's eye on a journey all the way to the far right before cutting back in to the center of the frame through here. It's this point in the center of the frame where we want our viewer's eye to finish up. And so through the editing, we want to take our viewer on that journey along that line. So one way to help do that is to darken down all of this foreground element here and reduce contrast through here so that our viewer's eye goes straight to this brighter section of grass running through here. I really love the play of light and shadow through the undulating hills in the background. So if we can use one of Luminar's tools such as structure to bring a little bit more information and clarity through there, that will be fantastic. Another issue that I had on the day was with the sky. It was pure blue, which was beautiful to look at, guaranteeing that I was going to get that lovely play of light and shadow through the hills here. However, it meant that I had no interest or no cloud formation to leverage in the composition of my frame. So what I would love to do is mirror the fact that we have this lead in line coming through here. I would love if we had some cloud formation or something cutting across from the top left and then bringing our eye background to this area, sort of finishing up at the center of the frame again. So I think what we'll do is exercise a little bit of creative license and actually do a sky swap in this photo. And the first tool I wanna to work with is obviously develop raw. And I will always make sure I switch out my Luminar default profile for a camera matching profile. And where you might think that a camera landscape photo, wow, that's really punchy and it does look pretty good straight away. It's a nice improvement. I prefer to work with a camera flat profile and that's gonna let me build that contrast back myself. And today I'm gonna to kickstart that with a smart contrast slider, pushing that to the extreme that's pretty good. I'm going to push the highlights down. That's just going to control that overexposure we were getting in the sky. If I double click to reset that, you're going to see that it is just a little bit too bright. And now I'm going to grab the shadow slider. Let's push that all the way up just to have a look what's going on, get familiar with where that's actually bringing in that shadow detail. And now we can bring it back down. Now we know what this slider is doing and just go, yeah, okay, we'll tickle a little bit of that in. And we're in a pretty good place. But now I want to make sure that I have a pure white point and a pure black point, but as you know, if you watch my previous videos, that isn't the best way to go about that. The best way to do it is to actually grab the white point and move that over, press our J key on the keyboard, and we can just start to see that we're clipping the whites out only through there on the snow. I'm happy with that. And now we can bring the black points over just until we start to see those little blue warnings saying, hey, you've pushed out to pure black there. And now I've zoomed out, we can see that I've actually crushed the blacks just a little bit too far on the left-hand side. So by doing an adjustment like that, we now have a full tonal range to work with. I'll press the backslash key on my keyboard and we can see the original raw import and I'll release and that's our raw edit so far. Next thing we wanna do is just make sure that we're happy with the color temperature. If you saw my video where I actually captured this photo, I spoke about how I was drawn to the complementary colors between the orangey yellows of the dry brush grass through here and the blue sky. That was what really appealed to me. So I don't really wanna push this down and neutralize the grass too much. I want to make sure that we're keeping that nice yellowy orange in the grass. And the saturation's looking pretty good, but I usually like to inject just a little bit while I'm doing this raw conversion or the develop raw tool, push a little bit more saturation at this point because we are accessing the raw data. And this is the best time if we want to push in a lot more saturation, we do that with the raw file and our photo is not gonna suffer from any posterization. So it's better to introduce more saturation than we want at this point, and we can always reduce the saturation later. I'm gonna zoom into 100% to make my sharpness adjustments. And now we don't wanna to go too aggressively with this because as you can see with the highlight warning still on, we're starting to introduce some haloing as indicated by the red fringing we're now getting around the mountains. So what I like to do is just push in a little bit of sharpening at this point to avoid that fringing while we're still sharpening up the photo as a whole. Dropping down the radius just a little bit can help with this as well. 
And because this is a landscape and we don't have any true geometry in the scene, I don't feel that I need to correct for any barrel distortion in my lens. I'm happy with this as it's captured. So onward and upward, let's close this tool down. And the next thing I'd like to do is just darken down this foreground so that our eye goes more towards that lead in line that we were looking at before. Now in my recent waterfall video, I demonstrated how we can duplicate the layer and we can actually change the blending mode to multiply. We can then come to the masking tool and just brush that effect in to darken down areas that we want to burn in. So let me just really quickly demonstrate this. You can see that we've darkened down that area. Obviously we do that with a nice soft brush, not what I've done there. But the problem with that is we are introducing more saturation that we would then need to control. And we are also introducing a whole nother layer. But while I do like that technique, it's nice and easy. You see the results straight away. There is a much better way to control the effect. So let me show you how you do that. Rather than introducing a new layer, what I'd like to do is work with the curves to control this. However, we've already applied a global raw transformation. So to access the curves separately, so I can just mask them in, I'm not gonna be able to do that here because any changes I make to a curve here, it's gonna affect the whole photo and I wanna keep my application of this effect over that. So how do I access a new develop tool? Well, I need to apply a separate tool first. So as soon as I apply, let's say some structure, doesn't matter what tool it is, I now have access to a brand new develop tool. The develop raw tool we were working on, obviously that now drops into our edit stack. So now, if we didn't want to apply any structure, we could just zero that out, no problem at all, and we would still have access to the develop tool here. So let's do that. Let's just leave that structure tool in the edit stack, and now I can come in to develop down to curves, and you can see, obviously, if I pull the curves down, I darken my image. If I push it up, I brighten the image. But the great thing is we can get a lot more refined than this. So what I want to do is actually darken the photo down but I don't want to crush the shadows too much. So I'm going to come into the shadow section of the curve and just boost that up just a little bit. And you would have noticed when we added an additional layer, changed it to multiply, that we increased the saturation of the photo as a whole. And we've done the same here as well. If we look at the before and the after, not only have we darkened the photo down, we've also added saturation. And that's not what I want. But the great thing is within the develop tool, we have access to the saturation slider. So I can drop that all the way down, I can boost it up. Or what I want to do is try and reduce it to a point that we've darkened the photo, with the curve tool, but we haven't affected the overall saturation. Something like that's about right. And now I'm able to come into my masking section, grab my brush, change it to the paint mode, make sure we're working with a nice soft brush, maybe make the size slightly higher, and I can click and paint. And this is gonna be very rough and ready at the moment. I just want you to see what I can do there. So before and after, we've darkened the foreground, our eye, and more importantly, our viewer's eye, now jumps much quicker to this lead in line through here. Those of you who watch the channel regularly will know that I like to build up my masks gradually. I don't wanna to go to 100% straight away. What I like to do is visualize areas where I want to darken down. So if I put a little top line through here, again, that's just gonna to help to frame the brighter lead in area of grass. And I'm also just gonna darken down this center area as well. I just felt like that was just a little too bright. Let's have a little toggle of before and after, before and after. And if we look at this section at the side of the photo here, and you remember that lead in line, and I was hoping that our viewers eye would curve around this mound here and come back this way. But we don't want the eye just to travel from the left and to the right of the frame and then just boop, fall off the edge here. So what I wanna do is just darken this little section as well. It's a little bit of a pain that we actually have this bright area next to the road here because that does catch your eye, but we can use this technique just to kind of dull that back if we want to. So I'll just paint over that and we'll toggle the before and after. It's subtle, but it is just helping to reduce its impact. If my intention is to do a sky swap like it is here, I don't like to go too far with my edit before I introduce that sky. And that way, if we introduce the sky early enough, we get to edit the photo as a whole, globally assessing it as it goes, rather than just working too heavily on the foreground, then bringing a the sky in and realizing ah, it doesn't quite work. Also, another benefit of getting that sky in early is that any of the editing tools that we then apply, we're putting that over not just the foreground, but the sky. And so those adjustments are affecting the image again globally and so it's helping to give more of a sense of cohesion to your final edit. You don't want to go a long way with that edit on the landscape, the foreground, all of that, and then drop in a new sky and go, it eh, doesn't quite tie in well enough. So that's what we'll do now, we'll put a new sky in. 
So I'm gonna close the Essentials editing section and open up Creative, because that's where we're gonna find Sky AI. I'm gonna to come to Sky Selection, and the one that I'm gonna add is a custom made sky specifically for this edit. And before I refine the positioning of this sky, I'll just quickly put on screen what it looked like originally. And you can see that I've actually finessed this sky so that it does match in with this photo much better. If you wanna see how I've done that, I'll put a link to it in the description. So now our sky's in there, we just need to make sure that we're happy with all of these settings. Let me just close these foldouts away so that we can just focus on one thing at a time. We've got the horizontal positioning of the sky, which is gonna allow me to bring this down. What I would like to do is actually have the wisp of cloud start pretty much here in the top left corner of the frame. That's gonna to help to give us a really nice lead in down, again, bringing our viewer's eye down to this central area here. The other thing that I really like about this cloud formation working with this particular scene is the fact that the angle of the cloud from top left coming down into the frame is basically a mirror image of the lead in line we have in our foreground. And I really like that symmetry that we've got going on. I don't feel like I need to do anything with the scenery lighting, there's no reflection to worry about, but I may just jump into sky adjustments because sometimes I find that boosting up the atmospheric haze can just help to knock back some of the saturation of the blue, just make the sky just look a little bit more believable. And one more thing that we could do here is just bring the brightness up just so that we're getting a really nice intensity to the whiteness of that cloud through there. I don't know, something like that. Let's have a little toggle of our before and our after before and after, it's just adding another element of interest into the photo. And if we want to, one thing we could do is just mask the sky in more selectively. So what I'm gonna do is just set my strength somewhere around midway. And now if I paint over this whole sky area, I'm gonna get 50% of that sky effect we just created. Much more subtle and we've got a nice 50-50 blend. But what I could do is now intensify the cloud lead in line that runs towards the center of the frame. And again, just make one more pass, helping to bring our viewer's eye more into the center of the frame because we have more contrast now in the center than we do at the edge of the frame. Okay, let's talk about controlling details. I wasn't sure whether we should cover this or not because we might get a longer video, but let me know in the comments if you guys don't mind a slightly longer video in exchange for the fact that you've learned something new. So. With that in mind, details. You don't always want to necessarily increase details in your photo. Sometimes you want to increase details in certain areas and pull it back in others. So in our example here, I'm finding that the foreground grasses, there's so much fine detail in those grasses that it's just too visually busy and it's screaming for our attention. I just wanna mute that down. And I don't always wanna do that just by burning it down, darkening it using that curves technique. It might just be a case of, you know what? It's over sharpened in those grasses. We just need to reduce that detail. And then through the mountains and that beautiful um, light and shadow play that we've got through there, that might be somewhere where we want to actually accentuate those details. So let me show you a couple of techniques that we can employ to control those aspects. So in terms of dealing with this kind of crunchy texture that we have going on here, um, there's a couple of things that we could do. Structure AI that we normally associate with taking in the positive direction and increasing structure, wonderful tool for doing that. But obviously we can also take that into the negative territory as well. Perhaps that's a little hard to see, so I'm just gonna boost the effect even further and just give us a little toggle of the before and the after. This is obviously not something we would want to apply through our whole photo and certainly not to this strength level either. But what about selectively just through some of these areas? Absolutely, we could do that. I'm just gonna click and start painting with my mask and I can just build that effect up if I want to. You know, I've applied this pretty lightly at the moment, but this was our before and after, super light. We can obviously go much stronger with that, so we're getting much more of that effect. But I'm just gonna pull that back a little bit because what I want to do is show you another technique. Those of you that were paying attention will know that we have now had a blur tool added into Luminar Neo and it's been implemented in a really nice way. The most basic form of blur is the Gaussian blur, but we also have motion blur, which allows us to add a sort of directional blur to things. We can have a twisted effect if that's what we want, and we also have tilt shift. So for the effect I'm gonna show you, we can either apply Gaussian blur with a mask or the tilt shift option. It's probably gonna get us closer quicker. So you notice in this most basic application of it, it is completely destroying the detail in the foreground. Well, if I come down to place blur center, what I can now do is actually control where we have our area without any blur, 100% blur, 
and the transitional zone. We can also change the rotation as well. So what if I match the blur rotation to our lead in line? And now I'm saying our blur can start from this line here and it's gonna reach maximum intensity at this bottom line in the bottom right corner. So if I just expand that slightly so we have a full transitional range, Obviously we have both the bottom and the top of the photo affected at the moment, but I'm gonna use a mask so that we can reveal it only in this bottom section. So if I just drew a linear gradient over that nice and quick, and jump back to adjustments, you can see that we've now just blurred the foreground. Obviously that's way too much again. So we can just grab the amount slider, find ourselves a little sweet spot. I know it doesn't look good at the moment, but again, we're not gonna apply this with full intensity. We're going to mask it in. So I'm gonna to jump to my brush mode and with the erase option selected, I can just reduce the intensity of the effect. So I'm just gonna get my eraser, and now we're bringing back some of that initial detail that we had, but the grass that sits around the very bottom of the frame now has a much softer quality to it. So here's our before, here's our after, before and after, and if you want a bit more subtlety, obviously we can come back in with the eraser again and then just take a little bit more of that effect out. Something like that. Here's our before, very crispy and crunchy, Here's our after, ah, nice and soft. Okay, I had no intention of this being a deep dive into how to control details inside Luminar Neo, but I do want to share with you my favorite technique. So if you know frequency separation, or you may have heard of it, it's a high-end retouching technique often reserved for skin retouching, beauty portraits, things like that. However, I've been using it for years with my landscape photography inside of Photoshop, but we can also use a very similar technique inside of Luminar Neo. Let me show you it, and if you also edit portraits, it's gonna come in very handy. Okay, to see this in effect, it's best to come into about 100%. Now, I'm gonna close down the creative section again, and within Essentials, we have the Details section here. Now, usually, most people just associate this tool with adding detail, but if you look at this, this is not a particularly nice result that is achieved. And if I crank all of these all the way to 100, you can see that we get this pretty much faux HDR look and it's not nice at all. But the great thing is because we have access to the small, medium and large details, we can actually separate out the way in which these detail sliders affect our photo. So what do we want to do? Well, we want to keep the details in the small high frequencies, such as small details and sharpen, which is effectively the ultra small details, if you will. So we're going to keep sharpen high, small details high, and the medium and large details, it's those that we're gonna bring down. So now if I toggle the before and after, we've got a softening effect going on, whilst at the same time, we're actually increasing detail through those high frequencies. When you zoom out, the effect is pretty minimal, but if you do look closely, you can see that it is actually adding a sense of softness and detail at the same time. Now, again, this is too much, so we could either mask this in where we want it more selectively, or what I'm gonna do in this case is just bring the amounts of these sliders back down to about half of what they were. We can fine tune things with the masking and the sharpening masking, but you know what? Like I say, it's not a deep dive, so I'm not gonna get carried away with all of that. Let's use another great tool for helping to guide our viewer's eye, and that is the vignette tool. And we do that by just darkening down the fringes of the photo, and by doing that, that helps to bring our viewer's eye into the brighter parts. I always like to jump into the advanced settings here, and usually I will be cranking up the feather amount just so that we have a softer transition. Occasionally I'll brighten up the center part of the frame by grabbing this inner light slider and just making sure that's set to a point so that we still have a good exposure in the middle part of our frame. And the size slider is also good for just determining how tight you want the vignette. And once you've got everything set up the way you want it, it's a good idea just to revisit the amount slider and then just tease the strength of it in, toggle your before and after, make sure you're happy, and then we can pinpoint our subject because this is one of the great things with the vignette tool inside of Luminar Neo. We can just click around our photo as I'm doing here and say, this is where I want the brightest part. And in our case, I'm just gonna click above the mountains here. I know it's a little higher than center, but that's gonna help to darken down that foreground again. So here's our before, here's our after. Okay, as my final steps, I'm just gonna have a play around with some of Luminar's nice and simple tools. So Structure AI, that's worth playing around with, and then use my eye to just glance around the frame and assess it for areas that I like the effect. Once I've got a good feel for that, I'll just grab my mask, my brush, make sure I'm in paint mode, and a low strength, somewhere around 15% is fine for this one. 
and now I can click and paint again with a nice soft brush and just make a couple of passes through this area where I really want to emphasize the structure of the hillside. Don't need to go too nuts and perhaps just one pass along the fringe of this cloud as well just to help make that pop as well before and after. Ah, oh, let's go again. Just a little bit more on that cloud. Yep, I'm happy with that. Okay, let's close that down and jump into the creative section. A lot more fun tools to play with in here. Let's grab the dramatic slider and have a little look what that's doing for us. <laughs> Whoa there, Neddy. You know, that's far too much, but I always like to push these tools, crank them all the way, and then it's just so much easier to see what the adjustment sliders are doing. So for example, by bringing down that local contrast slider, we can see when this amount is set to 100, we can see much more clearly how that is affecting the tool as a whole. We can jump into the brightness and saturation and we can make a decision, well, we don't wanna over brighten our photo and we also don't wanna take away too much of that lovely saturation. In fact, let's not take away any, let's set that at zero. Now we've got the adjustment sliders more where we want them. We can grab the amount and then we can toggle it up, bring it back down, thinking about the Goldilocks principle. Not too much, not too little. We want it just right. Let's have a little look. How about before and after? It's just adding a little bit more punch into the photo. Yeah, let's go with that. And if we feel like we're adding too much detail, things are just getting a little bit too crunchy on us, well, we can always come in and add my favorite filter, the mystical filter. So let me push that all the way up and you can see what a lovely dreamy effect that has on our photo. Now, I don't want to overplay my hand with this tool too much, but I'm going to push the amount to 100 temporarily so that I can clearly see what's happening with the shadows because now I can see that with zero set on shadows, everything's getting a little bit too dark there. And so I may want to just keep the shadows amount pumped up nice and high to 100. What about the smoothness? Now, I don't want to bring that down. I'm trying to eliminate the sort of crunchy texture I have going on. So by bringing the smoothness slider up with our amount at 100, we can clearly see what's going on with this photo. And now we've got the kind of softness that we want to this. We're now free to come in and reapply the amount slider with a lot less emphasis. We can be nice and subtle. I don't know, somewhere around 20. Let's have a look before, after. Oh, I don't know, maybe we can get away with a bit higher. Before and after. And I like what it's doing in the foreground, but I feel like it's brightening up our sky too much. So I'm just gonna erase it by about 50% through the sky. So I'll just click and paint through there. Maybe even just take it off of the sky a little more than that as well. Before and after. Now I really love the blue, yellow complementary colors here. So I'm just gonna have a little dive into the mood section and just see if there's a lookup table that's gonna benefit that blue, yellow combo. So I've pushed my amount to 100 and now I can just mouse over the different effects and it's so clear to see exactly what's going on. Perhaps Long Beach may be the way to go because it's adding a lovely rich warmth to the photo. And again, we can play with these sliders while everything's set to 100 so we can clearly see what's going on. You know, let's add a nice bit of saturation, nice bit of contrast, but certainly not with the amount anywhere near 100, but let's just start to tease it in and see where we like the look of it. Who knows, something like that, maybe it's a bit oversaturated. Let's pull some of that saturation out. Okay, let's have a little look at our before and our after with that tool, before and after. Hmm, now something's just not working with this photo at the moment, and I think it may be the saturation levels. Something's not quite right with the colors, and perhaps the sky is a little bit too bright. Now the best way to make these judgment calls is to step away from your photo, oftentimes for up to a day, so that you can revisit it with completely fresh eyes. While I'm recording this video, I don't have that luxury, so I'm gonna make some freestyle changes, hope for the best, and if it doesn't work out, I've got another technique that I've shared before, but you guys loved it so much, if you've missed it, it's a great technique just for toning down your overall processing. Okay, we'll close the mood tool down and we're gonna jump into the color tool. It's possible that our oranges have got away on us just a little bit. They've just got a little too saturated in my opinion. So I'm just gonna pull out some of the color from the orange. And if I play with the red slider as well, you can actually see that there is a fair bit of red color in this as well. So we'll also drop the red saturation. All the time I want to revisit my eyeball tool so I can do a before and after. Yeah, maybe a little more subtlety in this is what's called for. One thing I'd recommend you do when you're working with color, if you're not quite sure which colors are influencing different parts of the photo, just grab the saturation slider of the whole photo and crank that up so that you can clearly see what colors are affecting your photo where. 
then it's much easier to come in and grab the slider that corresponds to that particular color. So I'm wondering if there's a little bit of purple and magenta coloring that was just creeping into the clouds here. Let's drop the saturation down and now we can actually work with the hue of the blue as well. If I take it to the left, those blues get a lot more cyan. If I take it to the right, we start to introduce more purple magenta into those blues. I don't think it's the hue that's the issue. I'm wondering whether it's the brightness itself. So if I grab the luminance slider, that's actually going to darken down those blues. Okay, I quite like what it's doing in certain areas of the sky, but I don't want to do that over the whole photo. I want to be able to mask it in. And currently we have affected the saturation of the oranges and reds. And so let's just apply that application of the color tool. So now we can see in our edit section, we have that applied. If we jump back to the tools again, we can apply a brand new color tool and now we can just work with the sky itself. So I want to come into the luminance, i.e. the brightness of the sky, and I'm just going to pull that blue slider down. As you can see, it's really darkening off that top right hand corner. That's too much, but I don't mind what it's doing through here. So I'll grab my mask, maybe even a radial circular mask might be the way to go in this one. And it's got a little desaturated by doing that. So I'm just going to grab the saturation slider, bump that back up and just work with my brush tool on a low amount and the erase tool just to create a more seamless merge. As you can see, it's bled over and is affecting the mountains here. So I just want to make sure that we're not darkening down the blues through the mountains. OK, I'm going to call that done and we'll look at our before. This is our original import, our polarized photo. This is our after that we've created, added in that sky before and after. It's OK, but I think I may have overcooked it. And if that happens to you as well, it's a simple solution. All you need to do is re-add your original photo as a new layer, and then you can control the opacity of that layer, therefore reducing the overall effect of what you've created here. Let me show you how that works. So I'm going to come to the plus icon here, and I can either add the polarized version, which is the one we've been working on, or alternatively the photo without the polarizer. And now if I click that, it's been dropped in at 50%. So we see half and half at the moment. I'll push it all the way to 100 just so that we can apply a quick raw edit. We certainly need to warm it up a bit. And just very quickly, I'm going to get Neo to remove the dust spots off my sensor, which I really should have cleaned myself. And so now we have a layer without any of that fancy editing. And if I hide that layer, you can see the pretty heavy processing that I put onto this version. So what we want to do is show the layer and now we have the ability to reduce the opacity of the unedited layer and take it all the way down and we can reveal the underlying edit. 100% is none of the edit and now we can just choose our sweet spot. So now if we put the opacity of this layer at 30%, we now only see 70% of the photo that we edited originally. In other words, we've created a slider that controls the intensity of our overall edit. So now we have our before and after a slightly more refined version of that edit. If you're watching this edit, I'm sure you have Luminar Neo already, but if you don't and you want to get it at a discount, I do have a link in the description below. And if you'd like to see how I captured this photo out in the field, I'd love to share that experience with you. You can watch that in that video right there. Thanks so much, guys. I'll see you in the next video.